Allah says Al-Hakumu Takathu Competition over dunya has distracted you from the Akhirah And our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has established the same meaning in the Sunnah As Imam Al-Bukhari and Muslim narrate on the authority of Anas that he said Alayhi Salatu Wasalam A man only ever gets older and older But there are two characteristics inside of him that only ever gets younger and younger he says the first of these characteristics is the love to live a long life. And the second of these characteristics is the love for wealth. This is a fitrah. This is something Allah has put inside of us. We cannot escape it. Now what does this mean? It means that there are very few things out there in the life of this world that has the ability to manipulate and influence and change a person like that of wealth. Very few things can change the demeanor of a person and derail him from the path of the Akhirah to a different path like the power, like the power of wealth. Now with this in mind, brothers and sisters, after having established how wealth is loved and dear to every one of us innately, I shift your attention to a particular generation of Muslims. These were the greatest human beings to walk the face of the globe after the messengers and the prophets. A people who used to be very, very poor. They were at the peak of poverty and destitution and then all of a sudden they became rich. But did it change them? This is what we are about to establish bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. We are due to be speaking about the companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his very students, the Sahaba. They were people of poverty and let us consider the following. Imam Ahmad narrates in his Musnad on the authority of the companion Anas. Listen to this, Ya Ikhwani, and try to perceive what is being said and try to imagine the poverty. That the Prophet wasallam said, I was placed in fear at a time when nobody else was afraid. And I was punished and hurt at a time when nobody else was being hurt. And he said, I remember a time when 30 consecutive days passed when me and Bilal had nothing to eat except what little Bilal would hide under his armpit. Allahu Akbar. Poverty. Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim narrate on the authority of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha that she said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and his family never ate wheat bread to their fill for three consecutive days from the day he arrived to Medina till the day he died. If he ate bread to his fill on one day, he would not eat it on the second. If he ate on the second, he'd be hungry on the third. Allahu Akbar. Imam al-Bukhari narrates on the authority of our mother Aisha that she said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never ate two different types of food on one day except if one of the two was dates. And Urwa, he would say, that our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I remember times in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where a whole month would pass, a whole month, and no fire would be kindled in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning no food would be cooked. And she said we would be living off dates and water. She said sometimes, however, our neighbors would give us small bits of meat to eat. Qatada the Tabi'i, he says that the companion as Anas ibn Malik, he said, Never in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was he given the opportunity of eating soft bread. And never had he eaten fried mutton. In his life, he never saw these things, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Poverty, real poverty for the most part. And you all remember the narration where a woman, a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Inni majhood, I am really hungry. I am really, really poor. So the Prophet ﷺ sent for one of his wives saying, هَلْ عِنْدَ كُنَّ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Do you have anything to feed this man? Can he be our guest? They said, O Messenger of Allah, we swear by Allah, we only have water in our house. He would go to the second wife. Do you have anything for him? She would say, Wallah, in our house we only have water. They don't have a single date. في بيوت النبوة In the households of prophethood, there isn't even a date in their kitchen. We only have water until the 11th wife and she would say, Wallah, we only have water. And you remember the narration of the Sahabi who came to the Prophet ﷺ wanting to get married. And he said to him, Mada What have you given her as, as dowry? He said, I haven't given her anything. I, I have no mahr to give her. He said, Amhirha walaw khataman min hadid. Give her a dowry even if it's something as simple as an iron ring. He said, Wallahi, I don't have an iron ring to give her. 
The companion said, so I will give her my lower garment. He said, if you give her your lower garment, you will be unclothed. You will be naked. The point of mentioning all of this, brothers and sisters, is to establish the poverty, the destitution for the most part of their lives and for the majority of the Sahaba. But things would change. Things would change. The Prophet ﷺ would pass away. After delivering the message of Islam with miraculous success and utmost completion, and then Abu Bakr would assume leadership and he would fight the apostates al murtadun and then umar radiyallahu anhu would then assume leadership and this is when the conquests began to rise and now allahu akbar as islam travels to the four corners of the globe for the first time in the lives of the companions they were now being exposed to the treasures and the riches of the world notice from extreme poverty to extreme wealth but did it change them did it change them this is what we want to establish during the time of Umar, the armies of the Muslims reached the gates of Paja and they were conquering their cities one after the other till they arrived to Al Madain, which was the very capital of the Persian Empire. And they got to the palace of Kisra ibn Hormuz, the emperor of Persia. Can you imagine, Ikhwani? Can you imagine? Now they have arrived at Persia. This was the land that the Sahaba used to hear so much about in Jahiliyyah. They used to hear about the land of Paja, the weather of Paja, the wealth of Kisra. And now, and now with Islam, they are inside of Paja. They are inside of Al Madain and they have conquered the very palace of Kisra ibn Hormuz. They enter the palace and they now see what they had read about and heard with their very own eyes. But did they change? They saw the crown of Kisra that was studded with pearls and rubies, a crown that was so heavy with gold and silver that it was suspended to the ceiling with chains because it was too heavy to be carried by the head of Kisra without support. They saw the carpets of Persia that were sewn with gold and silver and pearl and had pictures of the emperors and the kings of Persia all across the carpets. They saw that. They were now seeing with their own eyes the chambers that they were unlocking one after the other. The chambers of gold and silver utensils, food and drink and cups. They saw it and the clothes of the emperors. They saw it. Silk, they touched it for the first time. They saw tons of kafur, that beautiful scented substance that is white in appearance, but the Sahaba did not know what it was. They thought it was salt. May Allah be pleased with them. So they mixed it with their food, with their ajin, with their dough, thinking it was salt. And then the ajin, the dough became bitter. So they realized it wasn't salt. And now, caravan upon caravan, loaded with gold and silver, was being transferred to Medina. From all across the globe, coming to Medina, and distributed between their rightful owners, and spent back in the path of Allah. But did they change? This is what we want to establish. All of a sudden, the companions now had wealth. They now, a lot of them had businesses and land. A lot of them were now investing as well. A lot of them became umara, governors of the cities and provinces of the world. Did they change? Well, let us look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, the Khalifa himself, Amir al-Mu'mineen himself. You will be surprised to know that in his lower garment, in his izar, there were four patches. And in his upper garment, his rida, there were 12 patches. Holes that had been sewn. And he would refuse to eat any of the luxurious food despite him now being able to eat meat every single day. He would eat oil, salt, and bread. And his stomach would rumble and he will say, you're not going to eat anything luxurious till the Sahaba all eat it as well. He would refuse to sleep on any expensive bedding. He didn't change. And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was once visited by an ambassador from one of the countries of the world to meet this, this great man whose empire has now reached all four corners of the globe to meet these, these Muslims. And he asked, which palace does he live in? They said, look in the masjid, you will find him there. And he entered the masjid and he saw Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, sleeping all by himself in the masjid. And he looked at Umar and he said to him, Oh Umar, you ruled and you were just. So you became safe and therefore you fell asleep. No gods needed. This is the justice of Islam. But they did not change. Dunya did not change them in the least. What about Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, a man who used to be poor, but then became the millionaire, as we all know, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Imam al-Bukhari narrates on the authority of Ibrahim, 
the son of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, that this millionaire, may Allah be pleased with him, was once presented with food. وَكَانَ صَائِمًا He was fasting. He looked at the food and before he ate, he said, My companion, my friend, Mus'ab ibn Umair was killed in the path of Allah, in the battle of Uhud. And he is better than me. But when he died, we couldn't even find a garment to cover his corpse that was sizable, big enough for his whole body. And as for us now, we have become leaders and governors and we have wealth. I fear that Allah is rushing for us our good deeds in dunya so that we have nothing in the hereafter. And he cried and cried and he left the food. They didn't change. And they remembered their former state when they had no money. And their activism for Islam only became stronger and stronger when dunya presented itself to them. Allahu Akbar. And Abi Huraira, who used to be a man of poverty, listen to what he says about himself. I remember when I used to be sat next to the pulpit of the Prophet wasallam, and I would faint and fall onto the ground because of intense hunger. And a man would come to me and place his foot on my neck, thinking that I was possessed by a devil. Abu Huraira says, I was not possessed by a devil. I was just very, very hungry. This is who they used to be. Abu Huraira then became an Amir, Allahu Akbar. He became a governor from one of the provinces of the countries of the world. Did he change? This is what we want to establish. Tha'alabah ibn Abi Malikin al-Quradi. He says, I remember seeing Abu Huraira when he was a governor, walking through the marketplace, carrying wood in the marketplace like a simple average man. And he was joking with the people because he had a sense of humor. And he was saying, make a way for the Amir. He didn't change. The hereafter centric people whom they were during times of poverty were the same hereafter centric people whom they were during times of adversity. Our mother Aisha, brothers and sisters, who was the woman who narrated many of those narrations that you just heard in the first part of the khutbah, where she illustrates her poverty and her husband's poverty, alayhi salatu wasalam. Things would change for her and wealth would be sent in her direction. Urwa, her nephew said that Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan sent for our mother Aisha 100,000 dirham as a gift to honor the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Urwa said she spent every single bit of it in the path of Allah. Notice at one point she had nothing. Now everything is being sent her way. It means nothing to her. And she is still that God conscious person who she was. Urwa said, I saw her as well giving out 70,000 dirham. I saw her giving out 70,000 dirham whilst she was sewing her clothes. She was sewing her clothes and she gave out 70,000 dirham. Her servant Barira said to her, Oh Aisha, you are fasting today. Why didn't you leave any money behind so that you can buy some food to break your fast? She said to her, Law dhakartini la fa'alit. If you reminded me, I would have done so. I forgot that I was fasting, Allahu Akbar. Dunya didn't change them. And one final example, Imam Muslim narrates in his Sahih on the authority of Utbah ibn Ghazwan. Utbah, a companion who used to be poor, but all of a sudden now became a governor. Did he change? He says, giving a khutbah like this to his people, reminding them of whom he used to be and what he has now become and what he aspires for in the future. Ya Allah. He says, O oh people, I remember a time when I was with the Prophet wasallam, and I was one of seven with him. That's all. And we had no food to eat except the leaves of the trees until we developed sores all around our mouths. He says, I managed to get hold of a bit of fabric. I split it in half. I took half of it for myself and made a lower garment, an izar, and I gave the other half to my friend Sa'd ibn Malik, who made for himself a lower garment. He says, as for now, things have changed as you can see. And all of those poor companions have now become governors. We have become governors of one of the cities of the world. And then Utbah said, and I fear, and I ask Allah to protect me from being a person who sees myself great in his own eyes, but is small and pathetic in the eyes of Allah. He didn't change. Allahu Akbar, dunya did not change them only for the better. Why am I mentioning these examples, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam? In order, in order to address one particular phenomena that all of us are guilty of to one extent or another. This is the phenomena where you may see an individual whom, for example, during his university years in study, is a very active Muslim, 
is a person who is engaging in da'wah, person who is pursuing knowledge, who has a fixed daily portion of Qur'an, a person who is very much interested in enjoying good and forbidding evil and benefiting the ummah and setting a vision for himself and the believers. Naam. But it may be that the moment this person graduates and gets hold of the degree and now becomes the recipient of a monthly salary, a small five-digit monthly salary, this person is no longer to be seen. He has changed. Money has changed him. The masjid now says, where is so-and-so? Where has he gone? The enjoining of good and forbidding evil now disappears. Her, his pursuit or her pursuit of knowledge now begins to deteriorate. What has happened? This person has changed. Never mind the wealth of Kisra ibn Hurmuz, the wealth of Persia. Never mind becoming a governor of a city. A simple monthly salary causes a lot of us to change and becoming a very average individual. And take this therefore, brothers and sisters, as a conclusion and as a rule of thumb. If you see a person, if you see a person, may Allah make us this person, whom after Allah Almighty gives him dunya, gives him success, gives him or her prosperity, gives him or her a successful business and a good trade. You see this person always remembering his or her past, remembering what they used to be, remembering those types of weakness and bankruptcy and poverty and saying, Ya Rabbi, allow me to use what goodness I have for the benefit of my hereafter. Know that you are looking at a very righteous person because he is imitating the companions of the Prophet Zuhd, Zuhd, altruism, minimalism, to take only little from dunya is not that you possess nothing. It is you do not allow anything to possess you other than your creator. This is Zuhd. Otherwise, a lot of the companions, they had wealth, but it was in their hands, not in their hearts. It was in their hands and beneath their feet, not in their hearts. This is Zuhd. And thus our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say, speaking about the value of wealth when it is in the hands of the correct person, he would say as Ahmad narrates in his Musnad on the authority of Amr ibn al-As, how good is pure money when it belongs to a pure man? How useful is money when it's in the hands of a righteous man? The Sahaba, many of them used their wealth as a ladder for Jannah. Uthman ibn Affan used wealth as a ladder for Jannah. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf used his wealth as a ladder for Jannah. Abi Dahdah al Ansari, Abi Talhat al Ansari. These are rich companions who use their wealth as a ladder for Jannah. This is what wealth can do, but with conditions. Condition A, it is earned from the halal. Condition B, it is spent in the halal. Condition C, the yearly zakah is given without hesitation or delay. And condition four, you do not allow this wealth to control you. You do not allow this wealth when it arrives to change you from the righteous person and the active person you used to be. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Allah says, oh you who believe, don't allow your wealth. And don't allow your children to distract you from the remembrance of Allah. But whoever allows his wealth and children to distract him, this person will be from the losers. Therefore, the takeaway message of today, my dear brothers and sisters, is buy and sell, work and trade, invest in the halal whilst maintaining your portion of the Qur'an. Buy and sell and be prosperous whilst maintaining your portion of ibadah at night when nobody can see you. Buy and sell and be prosperous, but be a person who prays in the masjid in jama'ah and enjoins good and forbids evil. Buy and sell, but set a vision for yourself as a Muslim. Buy and sell and be prosperous, but before you go to sleep, make sure that the main questions that cross your mind is, who am I? What am I? Where am I going? Why am I trading? Why am I saving up? What am I doing for my life? What am I doing for my akhirah? Buy and sell and be successful, brothers and sisters, whilst remembering the words of Ali radiallahu anhu, who would say, as Dirar ibn Damra narrates, as Abi Nu'aym in his Hilya mentions, Dirar says, I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib once holding onto his beard in the middle of the night all by himself, looking into the stars. He was moving about and turning from side to side as if he was in pain. And I heard him saying to himself, this was Ali, saying to himself, Ya dunya, Ghurri ghayri. Oh dunya, go and deceive somebody else. Abi ta'arratti, are you presenting yourself to me? Am ilayya tashawakti, do you have your hopes on me? Hayhat, hayhat. This is very far, you cannot get me. 
قد با ينتكي ثلاثا لا رجعت فيها I have divorced you دنيا three times you can never come back to me فعمرك قصير your life is so short وخطرك يسير and your hazards are so easy to attain آه من قلة الزاد وبعد السفر ووحشة الطريق he said my provisions they are so little and the journey ahead is so long and how scary a path it is that awaits.